This week, I'm excited to welcome to the show entrepreneur and business coach Adam Stott. In my deep delve to find out what it is about Adam which led to his success, we encounter his turbulent childhood. They lost everything, which then formed an obsession for his business. And we will discover how having a child totally changed his perspective on life. I'm pleased to have with me here, um, what I'm going to call you the famous Adam Stott, because <laughs> I've seen you so many times on all these different social media platforms. And I think that you are a testament of actually how to do it. It's fascinating. Oh, thank you. Listening to all of the advice that you give in terms of marketing, because like you, I'm a great believer in marketing. It's no good having a fantastic product if you don't know how to sort of market it. So um, welcome to, to my podcast. I'm very pleased to be here. It's great. And now the theme of this podcast is um, um, success is not normal. One <laughs> of the reasons I'm quite fascinated to talk to you is because you will get a lot of people coming to you who want to launch their own business, who want to be entrepreneurial. And you would be in a really good position to try and actually suss out those sort of people you think are, are going to make it. What are the sort of qualities? How could you tell a person that's going to succeed and those who are, who are dreamers? <laughs> so I, I totally agree. It isn't normal. When I, when I first meet entrepreneurs, if I really looked at clients that are top performers, there's usually an obsession type running through them and a drive, it's just got a fire inside them and an obsession where they just want to win, they want to succeed. So I think if you're looking for the qualities, I think obsession is actually one of the qualities. Are you absolutely obsessed with taking your product, your service to market? So obsession would definitely be one. Focus would be another. Like what I see, it's easier to tell you traits of people that are not successful and people that typically are not successful is people that jump from idea to idea to idea to idea. They can't stay focused on one thing. They're running enthusiastically in the wrong direction because they haven't got the focus. So I think having a focus of one thing that you are driving home, being obsessed about it, and the obsession needs to be an improvement-based obsession. So what I mean by that, it's like, We've got the thing and you start getting good results and then you go, you know what, I want to make this better. And then it gets better. And then you go, you know what, I want to make it even better. And you just keep pushing and improving and improving and improving and improving because you have that focus and that obsession. So I see that quality in people um, a lot. And then common sense is really important as well. So there's a, a lot of people that could be obsessed, could be focused, but they can't get out of their own way sometimes and they can't just look at things objecti objectively with intelligence. So what I mean by that is being able to look at what you're doing and say, hey, you know, if I wanted to do this smarter, what would I do? Is then that obsession, is entrepreneurial something that you're born with? Is it something you could train to be? So being a trainer, <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm asking. I would have you to say, right? Okay, okay so as a, as being a, a trainer, I thought it's really <laughs> interesting to answer that question. Can you train someone to be entrepreneurial? If the obsession, the passion, the focus is there, I think that the one of the most important things is focus, because if you get really focused, and I do believe that the skill sets can be learned. So the skill sets of running a, a business, as, as you know, is your marketing. You know, the best product or service doesn't always win. The best known product or service often wins. So marketing being really important. Branding, actually building that brand. Um, marketing can be learned. Branding can be learned. Yes. Sales can be learned. You're right, actually, because if you look at both of our sort of careers, we didn't start off as marketeers. We didn't start off no. as salesmen. We learned it. And so what I want to do is to go right back to the beginning to try and um, really target what is the abnormality within us that has enabled us to go and triumph and do amazing things? Yeah. So just tell me a bit about your background. So what, ma what makes me weird? No, exactly. <laughs> what makes you abnormal? You know. So, so uh, that's the, what I'm trying to do. So what, yeah. what I figure is people got to find that before they even start on their journey. Absolutely. So I actually feel that I kind of know the answer to the question. Um, if I take you back to when I was a young man, uh, very young, at school, 
Um, when I was 10 years old, we were at a private school. And when you say to, we, is that... Uh, me and my brothers. You and your brothers. So we used to go and have our little cap and have our little briefcases. And we lived in a beautiful home. And, you know, my dad had a Mercedes and a Rolex and he was successful. And around that time, um, unfortunately, he lost everything. And what happened in my life is I'd gone from having a very comfortable life with all the kind of nice things in life to actually moving to a, uh, a back of a transport calf with my mum um, and my two brothers and growing up in a tiny little bungalow that was tiny and, you know, filthy and needed, to, needed a lot of TLC. It certainly wasn't a home. And we went from having a lot to having nothing. Now, the interesting thing... Um, that is not what I think triggers me, but I remember having friends and still having friends that had a lot. And, and there's one particular friend, actually, that I used to go to his house at the weekends. We were very close, and he had his swimming pool. He had his tennis court. You know, they used to go to America and go on holidays, and they had a beautiful, beautiful home. I just used to think, I want that. You know, and, and I think that that was where a lot of my drive was created, and a lot of the obsession that I just talked about was created. It was like, if they can do it, why can't I do it? And I didn't have a mentality to say, oh, well, I'm not good enough. Because I think that happens to a lot of people. I was like, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I don't deserve it. I didn't have self-doubt. I was quite confident. And I just felt that, hey, you know, there's more to life than this. And I want more out of life. Mm. It's really interesting you telling that story because if I tell you a bit about my story because I'm from a family of 11. I've got eight brothers and sisters and we were really, really poor. I can remember um, three to a bed, my mom having to feed all of us with one chicken. And mm. as a way of supplementing the family income, my father had an allotment and it was my job to look after this allotment. And I can remember, and it's been interesting to see what age you were, around the age of 11, I made myself a promise that I did not want to end up you know, like these people, that I would do absolutely everything that I could in order to be sort of successful. So the obsession that you talked about started then around the 11. What age were you at? So that was around, so around, around the 11, but I didn't do anything about it, right? Mm. So I spent several years doing nothing about it at all. And actually, you know, we moved and the area that we moved to, I was around other people that were suppressed, if you like, and not ha getting everything they want out of life. You know, maybe they're happy that way, that's okay. But I was in an environment for quite a number of years where everyone that I was around wasn't really aiming high, didn't want to do much. Mm. And I spent many, many years not actually tapping into how am I going to change things? And I think it was only when I got to the age of probably about 16 and I realized that, hey, 16, 17, I'm going to have to take this into my own hands that that's when I started to look at changes. And there was another moment that actually triggered me about the age of 18 um, that I really realised, actually, this is something you can control. And I didn't realise that. And, and I'll tell you what that was. I went to work in a, a store. Every job that I'd had had been out working in cold in environments, in building, you know, like today, freezing cold outside, you know, not enjoying it, working my hands, doing rubbish jobs. So I did that a lot for my dad, working for my dad who was a builder. And then after that, I then went and got a job in KFC. Don't cut that bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually worked in KFC for a little while and it was a horrible job as well. And I met a friend of mine I just got this job in this nice warm environment that had free coffee and it was selling TVs, washing machines, cookers and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, I want to work there. That'd be amazing. I went to see him at the weekend and he was there. He's dressed up. He's looking all flash. And I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. And then he rung me and he said, actually, they've got some positions you should apply. So I went and applied for this job and uh, I didn't get the job. And I remember being really gutted. And then this same friend came back and he went, oh, I lost my job. They got rid of me. And then I actually got a phone call that said, hey, we've got a position that's opened up. And I remember having to go to him saying, well, would you mind if I took this? And to be fair to him, he said, no, no, crack on. So I went, went in for the interview and I got there and they gave me a salary. And when they gave me a salary, I was like, this is awesome. Um, I'm in a warm environment. I've got free coffee. All I do is I talk to people. And then one of the ladies takes me aside, her name was Diane, and she said to me, Adam, uh, this is how it works. When somebody comes in, you go and talk to them, 
And when you go and talk to them, if they buy a TV or they buy a cooker or they buy a washing machine, you get three to 5% of the sale. And I was like, no, that's not how it works. You, you're paying me already. He's like, no, no, you get that extra. I was like, what? I was, and, and literally, I, I, I changed. And, I, and it transformed me because I had actual control. I could impact and influence the amount of money I was making. So all of a sudden, I turned into the Tasmanian devil, running around, meeting people, trying to do business with people. I wasn't very good at it, but I had enthusiasm, which is incredibly important. And that showed me that actually you can impact and you can make changes yourself because I didn't know until that point you could. I felt like everything was given to you. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and I think when you're relying on somebody giving things to you, you don't tend to get very much. Yeah. You know, if, if it's so, meant to be, it's up to me, yeah? Exactly. And so what, <laughs> everything you're talking about is mindset. Yeah. So none of this is about an education. Yeah. This is all about how you change your sort of mindset. And one of the challenges I think people have if they want to go and do their own thing is about actually changing the mindset. A lot of people think you need to be qualified or you need funding. Actually, no, the most important thing you've got to sort out is sort of mindset. But let me just go back then to your father. So how did your father feel when he lost everything? And then what did he do from, yeah. that, from so, that place? So my, my dad, um, who was successful in the, in the 90s, he had an underpinning business in building. Um, he expanded that out and got two transport cafes. So he had an underpinning business, two transport cafes, and... What happened is that the underpinning business, from my understanding, because obviously it was a bit young to understand then, um, the underpinning business ended up propping up the transport cafes. And then in the 90s, when the interest rates went up massively, uh, it all sort of came down like a, a deck of cards. And my, um, my dad obviously had to go bankrupt. That ended up in a divorce. And I think it was very, very painful for him. Credit to him, because... He really did work very, very, very hard. His work, work ethic was, was amazing, really. And actually, my mum as well. My mum, both my mum and my dad bounced back from difficult circumstances. Both of them did. And my dad went on to build a property company and buying and selling properties. And he worked his way out of it to the point where he retired. And he retired actually pretty wealthy. He did okay. You know, but he had a, a massive dip and actually he probably had a decade of real struggle, like real struggle, um, strugg struggling to make any money, struggling to get jobs. I think he went from being here to being right down here to then actually getting himself back on solid ground. Um, and my mum as well, um, my mum went from being a uh, house, housewife with uh, three children, living in a beautiful home, you know, having everything uh, that she wanted to actually running a transport cafe on her own with three children where she'd never ever worked in a transport cafe before in her life, getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning, um, opening up, serving lorry drivers breakfast to take us to school, to then go back, serve more breakfasts and more lunches, to then picking us up from school. And she did that for, again, probably a decade. And she made it really successful and she ended up selling that business. And you see, this is what I think is essential. You, in order to be successful, you have to go through the pain. 100%. You have to go through the pain. Yeah. Mm. So in terms of, so tell me a bit more about your story then yeah. in terms of, so you have this, this moment of you could actually be in charge of your own destiny. How do you go from um, trying to sell whatever you were selling into then starting your own business? Yeah, so I did really, really well um, at the company I was working for, Powerhouse. And one day I met, a, a young girl that w was over the park. It's not a story about a young girl. This is a story about her boyfriend, unfortunately. Right? Oh, right, <laughs> but her boyfriend thought... ends up turning up at, at the uh, at the park. So well, hold on. So this is a girl you fancied. And uh, you, no, you went to chat her fancy her, maybe. Okay, so I, do, well, I need a bit of love in my <laughs> podcast. So, you know, let's just explain. So there's a girl you fancied. And then you went to meet her at the park. And then her boyfriend turns up. So her boyfriend turns up in a brand new Chrysler. And you we're, had nothing. We were all 20 years old. I thought that I was, you know, absolutely crushing life because I was making X amount of money a year sending TVs and washing machines. And he tells me that he's a car dealer and he's working for Chrysler and you get a brand new car and you earn 50 grand a year. So I was like, right, I'm going to do that. So I went out. I found my... So hold on. So you lost the girl 
And but he gave you the motivation. Well, he definitely showed me again. It was I also think so when we talk about success, I think having a glimpse is very, very important. Right. Very, very important. When you see something and you see other people doing it, that really shows you, hang on, if, if that guy can do it, I can do this. You know, like my, that's my mentality. If I feel like if someone else can do it, then there's got to be a way. You know, I'll learn the skills, but I have the belief. So I looked at him. I said, I'm going to get into car sales. So I went into car sales, started working at Ford, and I was horrendous for probably the first six months. Now, what I realized at this stage, because it was only about 19, 20. So what, just, when you say you were horrendous, what made you horrendous? What made me horrendous is I was very enthusiastic. I was really good with people, and I really cared about my clients, but I was horrendously organized. So at this point, I realized there's not much in selling a cooker or a toaster. You just give them the cooker, right? You give them the toaster. Selling a car, you've got your logbook, you've got your paperwork, you've got the follow-up processes. You know, there's so many moving parts to it. Has it been MOT? Does it need paintwork? Does it need anything done? And all of a sudden, every sale I made had 50 moving parts. And it threw me. And it took me a good six months to actually let my brain expand because my, my brain was too small to actually handle all those moving parts. But I had massive enthusiasm. You know, I was so enthusiastic. Like, this is what I wanted to do. And when I got the shot to go and work in that role, I was I, I worked as hard as, as you can possibly work. So my lack, of, my lack of organization at that stage meant that I probably had to work double the hours of everyone else just to get it done because I was so unorganized. I could sell the cars, no problem. But so I worked hours after hours after hours, and then I finally got it. And once I got it, I became really successful in that role. And I started doing really well, and I started earning good money, and I got a brand new car. And then I hit another plateau, because I, I looked at it and thought, hey, you know, do I want to be, do I want to stay here, or do I want more? It's a weird thing because that had been a real, really big goal for me, but I just hit this plateau where I was like, I want more. Now, around the same time, and this is something that, you know, is very in context, around the same time, I started getting into personal development and I started reading a lot and I read things, you know, all the normal stuff that people would read, like Think and Grow Rich. And I started going on some Tony Robbins seminars and it got me all pumped up and hyped up. And I started thinking, you know what? I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a millionaire. And I remember I used to write down my goals and write down my dreams and everything I wanted. And I do remember my brother and one of his friends one day finding my piece of paper and my, my pad that said, I want to be a millionaire and I want this and I want this and I want this and getting ridiculed. Like, you are never going to do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. They're laughing, teasing me. But again, that was, I, I kind of made, I just made that decision. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. I tell you what's really interesting. There's a theme that through this conversation, obviously, focus is quite important, but also you're quite prepared to go through personal growth and development in order to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are, uh, because I think that's a really important attribute. You've got mm -hmm. to know where your strengths are, where your your weaknesses are, and then what you need to do in sort of developing. So um, you, there was obviously a period in your life when you, you went through this sort of personal development journey. Uh, massively, and. The thing is, I was a useless student. Like, I mean, the worst student at school you've ever met. I did nothing in school. I got no GCSEs. I often felt in the room like I was the thickest person in the room. You know, in the classroom, I had people telling me in, in my... Cl I, I was just written off, frankly, as, as a student. I'm useless. Really useless. But I think it was that control thing. Once I learned that actually you can control your own destiny and you are in charge of what you create. Once I learned that, that's I think things started to change. And this is what interests me then. So you got brothers. Did they also have your same uh, mindset or were you different somehow? So that's a really good question um, to speak to my brothers. I think my brothers have different qualities to me. Yeah, so what I'm trying to work yeah. out is back to trying to concentrate because you would have had the same experience yeah. in terms of growing up. Yeah. And then what is no, it What is it that made they you... They definitely see that experience differently than I see it. So, yeah, so that yeah. experience actually meant that it, they were headed up in one direction because yeah. what would typically happen in that scenario, 
people then get really risk averse, for example, yeah. and they want to control everything, and so they they stay small. That's the, yeah. that, that's a, a, an extreme reaction. And then you know, for you to do what you did was very courageous. You know, not to see that experience limiting you. And I'm trying to understand where did that sort of come from? I think for me, confidence was built on little wins, and and I think that I had that little win where actually I became good at selling. And then I thought, wow, I'm good at something. You know, I think from a self-esteem perspective, being rubbish at school, being rubbish in all the jobs I did, I never really found what I was good at until they actually gave me an opportunity to go and talk to people. And then I, I thought I was good at this. And then it just created a confidence inside me that I then went and did it at Ford and then I went off to BMW and I did it there. And the next natural step was to go and start your own business mm. because I just built... I was building the confidence. Yeah, but you see, what I think is this, is that I think that, look, I was a person that left school without any qualifications. I'm dyslexic. And, you know, I, like you, felt that I was the thickest person in, in the classroom. So I think it probably means that we develop different skills in order to survive. And selling is about actually having an instinct about human nature. Definitely. So there's yeah. got to be something oh, definitely. understanding human nature. You could understand yeah. what people are, are saying before they even say it. So that would 100%. Some, that, is that what you would have acquired, do you think? I think definitely that my social skills at school were actually quite good. You know, and I think that uh, as a skill set, definitely the brain is wired in different ways, isn't it? So somebody, and often actually, I don't think I, am, I I'm not good at spelling, but I'm not dyslexic, so I'm not... I, w I wouldn't say that I'm dyslexic, but I've got, I know lots of successful people are. And I think that the, the brain is wired more towards creativity than academic. So I feel that at school, the way that you are judged at school is, is left brain. Yeah. So it's sit down, do your piece of paper, see if you can get the right score, get a pat on the back for your concentration skills. Yeah. Now, I definitely don't have great concentration yeah, skills. You see, yeah. I absolutely believe the whole educational system is geared towards left-brain people. Yeah. It's about, actually, you're just like a computer. Stick the information yeah. in and regurgitate it. <laughs> yeah. Whereas right-brainers are the creatives. They're absolutely. The, they're the change yeah. makers. They're the innovators yeah. because they say, well, why not? Yeah. Who says you got to? Yeah. Uh, who says you've got to abide yeah. by this rule? Yeah. It's challenging the rules of convention. So I've always believed that the more and the rebel, uh, the rebel, the, exactly. Yeah. And the more educated you are, the less likely you are to be creative and 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 change things because you're conditioned to work within a a, a, a framework, framework yeah. of, of, of operating. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I've always been creative. Um, I'm quite a creative person. I, I even enjoy drawing. I enjoy doing creative tasks, and that's something that I do enjoy. And I, jo I enjoy actually solving problems as well. So when I see a problem, I enjoy saying, how could that be solved? How could that be done better? Like, I like that. Mm. That's something that I enjoy. Never being satisfied, I think, is, is yeah. a, it's quite important. So you then decide that actually, you, so you're doing this personal development you're, you go to see Tony Robbins, and I mean, anybody going to see him will be sort of <laughs> inspired. I mean, it is. He's very it's, inspired. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, one of, one of the things I do before I go to bed at night is I go and I would listen to my TikTok um, videos to go to sleep on some form of inspiration oh, because nice. it, I think it just drums it into you yeah. what is possible. Because if you live in a world where there's so much negativity, you can be then conditioned to sort of see the world that way. So you need to keep sort of having these sort of positive influences. Where, where, where were you in your personal life and how old were you at this time before when you're going through this development? So I was going through the, deve the development stages. So what I did is I developed individual skills. So what actually happened was when I was at Ford, I wanted to be a masterful salesperson. So I just read every single book I could get my hand on, hands on, bought every single training course I could get my hands on. I just got obsessive about sales and I wanted to learn everything and then I started using the things I was learning and I saw it work and I was like oh this is amazing it's like that works and that works and and I found myself getting an edge and I was rising to the top very quickly and it just again it increased my confidence and I just felt like hey you know do you know what it did in terms of my confidence it actually it actually made me believe that I had the ability to learn and be resourceful so school made you feel that you couldn't learn, but you actually learned by actually... When, when you're obsessed about something, it's easy to sort of learn. Yeah, um, definitely. And, and by the time. 
the learning um, is all about understanding human psychology because that's what selling is. It's yeah. about uh, what, you know. Yeah, which uh, I love. Uh, I, I yeah. actually love it as yeah, well. Yeah. It's understanding why people do the things they do. And it's not what they say what's important, it's what lays behind what they say, really, which is Absolutely. very important. I, I love it, you know, and I love, I still to this day love sales. I still love it. You know, it, it, it lights me up because I enjoy it. But the way that I see it is, you know, sales is, is very simple. You know, find people's problems, solve them, link your products or solution as the, as the thing that solves the problem and people will buy it. So everybody know? has a problem that they want somebody else to solve. Absolutely. Which, and which if is, you create something that solves problems, they'll buy it. Exactly. You know, sell to serve, help people get what they want, you'll get what you want. You know, and the more that you do that, the more money you make. And and, and that that drove me. Um, and, and in my journey, I then moved on to do it at BMW. Yeah, so you went from Ford to BMW. Yeah. And then what? So then I had a new challenge. <laughs> All right, yeah. Of course, because that's what always happens. Yeah. And, and what happened there is... At Powerhouse, I developed how to get over rejection. Just go and talk to as many people as you can. At Ford, I developed discipline to become organized, um, to work hard, to put the hours in, to make the calls. At BMW, it was very different. So when I got into that environment, everybody there was just so different than they were at Ford. Ford was like army regimented, everything done in exactly the right way. When I was at BMW, I got there, everyone was kicking back. Everyone was relaxed and I couldn't understand it. And I actually rubbing my hands together thinking I'm going to clean up here. That was my, I was like, I am going to clean up. I'll work harder on all of these and I'll do this and I'll do that. And then I realized something new that I didn't get. It's all about relationships because I went in and I didn't clean up and I didn't, wasn't as successful as quickly as I thought I was going to be successful because the other people that were kicking back is they were building relationships. They weren't rushing anything where I was going in and I was rushing. You wanted to make the deal, whereas they saw the deal was in a long-term relationship. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then I learned about building, how important building relationships was. And I had a three, three and a half years schooling in that. And I became in that environment for, for a young age, very successful. I would say at the, at the age of, say, 23, 24, I had a new £100,000 car, any car I wanted. I was earning over £100,000 a year. And everyone around me, I was, I was above in terms of the amount of money I was earning, the things that I was doing. I'd bought my own home. You know, I was in a good place and I was doing really, really well. But just before we go on to that, tell me about relationships because relationships are the key for business. Yeah. And relationships ultimately comes down to trust. Yeah. And about how do you get people to sort of trust you? So are there any sort of key points you could raise about actually the importance of relationships? I think, first of all, invest the time. You've got to put time into the relationships. And one thing that I always do is I try to come from a place of giving rather than taking in, in every situation. I'm just like, hey, how can I help this person? And I, I want to build goodwill. And if I can just keep building goodwill, goodwill, it, it comes back. You know, knowing that you're not there to take, you're actually there to give. And I think if you do that in as many situations as you possibly can, then you tend to build your brand, your reputation as somebody that's a, a nice person as well, you know, and giving people the time, trying to solve people's problems, trying to help them, trying to direct them. And, and I think that what I learned and the, the changer for me was don't go to take, go to give. Mm. So how could I solve the problems and help the people the most? And it was, it was weird because my whole, it turned my whole sales philosophy on its head. Mm. Right. For my whole sales philosophy before that was speak to as many people as you can, make as many pictures as you can, calculate the numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very disciplined to actually, how can you solve more problems for people? How can you help people more? And when you do that, then you've got referrals coming out of your ears. You've got people recommending you coming out of your ears. You've got people that want to be friends with you, people that want to spend time with you. So I think investing time is very, very important and go to a place to give rather than to take. That's Which a really good piece of advice. So that was your, that's a big piece of learning to be successful because yeah. you can't be successful without actually the mm. relationships and investing in oh, relationships. Massively, yeah. So you, you do that and then what else to, uh, in, in your journey? So what, what happened then is I've, I've, I did really well at BMW, got really, really successful and then control was taken away from me and it was a bit of a trigger point for me. So what happened was I just had a massive year 
You know, I remember them holding up my paycheck as a 23-year-old man saying, hey, everyone, Adam's just earned £17,000 this month. You know, some of you are earning £2,000 a month. He's earned seventeen, right? You know, you need to do what Adam's doing and he's the best salesman and all that. And I, and I loved it. And they were really actually embraced. They're really, really good. They built good relationships with me. They really were inspiring. It was completely different. At Ford, it, it was more like that, you know, hold a person down. At BMW, it was lift a person up. And, and that really inspired me and motivated me. But then something changed. And I went back in. I remember planning in one December because I'm a big planner in December. You know, I will sit down in December and I will craft out my year. Every, I've done it every year for as long as I can remember. That is a full day on my own, big pieces of paper, putting it on the wall, crafting out what I'm going to do. I always do it. I've always done that since I've been very young. You and still do it now? I still do it now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah I, I still I do so it. So come December, don't come near you. You're doing your plan. Well, I'd, I'd give at least one day to, on my own, no distractions, no one around me, what am I going to accomplish step by step for that coming 12 months? Mm -hmm. Zero base thinking. We're starting from zero in, in January. What are we going to do? What are we going to create this year? What's it going to be for us? I do it every year. And I was doing that at BMW, and I was working off the pay plan that I've given, and I remember coming back in in January, raring to go, ready to go, like, I'm going to crush this. And being given a new pay plan, which was 50% less than what I would have done if it was on the old plan pay plan. And I just sank. Like, I can't grow anymore. And it was like someone... Well, explain to me this pay plan. So what, what, what is... Why... So you were, your targets were 50% less or what? Oh, no, yeah. The, so what they've done is they've reduced what you got paid per unit. They were oh, no I longer see. paying you on profit. Oh, I see. And all of a sudden, you didn't have any control or influence really oh, over see. what you made. And it was designed to cap it. Oh, I It was see. designed to cap the income at 60K. And I went into the management like, why would you do that? You just told everyone to try and inspire them that they want to earn more money. I'm inspired. I want to earn more money and I want to push on. And you've got this environment where everybody wants to do well, wants to drive the business. And, and why would you do that? And then they said, Adam, you made more than the uh, head of business last year, the MD. Mm. And I said, right. Like, like, and he said, and, and, and that's why. And I was like, yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. You want to build a sales team. And I, I couldn't see it. You know, I've never capped anyone because of this ever. And then what essentially happened is one of the, the manager leaned over to me, leaned in really close, said, Adam, look, the bottom line is, so if you don't like it, you can leave. And I was like, yeah, and if I leave, I'm your top salesperson. I'm selling the most units. I'm selling you 40 a month. Everyone else is doing 10. He said, well, that's fine because we'll just get four of you instead to sell 10. Corporate structures. Yeah, basically. and I was just like, yeah. oh, I didn't use the language. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like bad language, but well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's classic corporate structures. Yeah. Really. It's no longer about performance. It's about people holding on to a job. Yeah. And I suppose, again, because the brand is so big, yeah. you could have that sort of arrogance. It's yeah. sort of one of the things I think is really important in business is to stay hungry. Yeah, definitely. And absolutely yeah. stay hungry. So obviously you could see that you decided that you either were going to become one of these sort of corporate bods doing Oh, definitely. A job. That was the path. Yeah. The path was, well, you can move up and, you know, you can do this and you can do that. And and I just, I was like, I'm starting my business. So from that point, you decided... <laughs> so I'm starting my business, that's it. So so did it just come out of the blue like that or was there always a thought in the back of the head? Oh, I've want... been wanting to do it. And I'm like, I'll do this when I'm 25 or I'll do this when I'm 28 or I'll do this when the time's right or I'll do this when, you know, I've got 200 grand in the bank and I've got like, all of that. So all... you always had in the back of your mind that one day you would start your 100%. own business. Okay. So where did that feeling come from that one day you want to do your own thing? I knew so... I couldn't be a millionaire working in that struct in the structures i just couldn't i couldn't see it and i wanted to be so you always knew that in order to actually achieve what you wanted you'd have to do your own thing yes. and actually um that disappointment in a sense was the the, the 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 starter for you if i'd have been able to find a vehicle where it wasn't my own thing i don't think i would have been bothered mm. so if someone some hedge fund manager went right adam come in and work in there and you can earn a million a year i'd have been like all right Okay, so <laughs> but, that, but the vehicle was limited. Okay, I see. So that yeah. because that was the figure that you'd yeah. set, that was the target you set yourself. Yeah. That's what you wanted to achieve. 
But even so, it does take courage to go from an idea to actually doing it. Or stupidity. Well, you've got to be. <laughs> well, well, you see, what I believe is yeah. this, is that, you know, a lot of people, if they plan, if they think about it too much, if it's yeah. rational, they'll yeah. never do it because it, it, it never, ever Absolutely. makes sense. You know, so this is where we come about success is not normal. Yeah. There's got to be some abnormality. People look at you. Why the hell would you want to give that up? To go and start something that you have absolutely no evidence at all that that's going to sort of work. And that's that's exactly what I did. And when I started started it, that's when I hit my biggest so, challenge. So tell me what you started. So tell me. So what. my first business that I started was a finance business, and what that was is that it was working on behalf of finance companies to introduce their finance products to car buyers. So that was the first thing I started, and I I was like, well, I understand finance because I've been working in finance for, um, with cars for many, many years. I know lots of people, I've got great relationships, so I'll go and do that, you know? And I was like, and hey, right now, when I sell a BMW on finance, the business makes 4,000 pounds, and I make 50 pounds for, for setting that up, but I'd make 4,000 pounds if I set that up. So it was like logical to, you know, I can do this. So, I went and that's what I decided to do. And then I had an array of challenges. You know, the, f the first challenge was this is in 2008. So pretty much as soon as I left, every single finance broker in the market just decided that they weren't doing this no more. They didn't want to work with small brokers. They weren't. So literally my entire panel of lenders was gone within three months. And why was that? Because of the, it was 2008 and the economy changed. So it was, it was in yeah, the recession, was it? Yeah, okay, it, was, right. it was like the queues were going outside Northern Rock. So I just lost. So you started off, and you see, I've always believed that the best time to start a business is in a recession. Yeah. You know, because it can't get any worse. Oh, it definitely couldn't get any worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was just like, oh, what am I going to do? And I didn't know what to do. And, and to be honest, this, my, I had real lack of skill sets at that stage. I could sell. I was good with clients. Give me the clients, I'll be good with them. But I had no clients. I didn't know how to get the clients. I didn't know what I was doing. And I just worked very, very, very hard. And I, I then I... You were then, doing what though? So, you lost so what I did is I spent the first... So in the first year... I'd, I sold my house to start the business. I was like, I need some money. Were you married or anything like that? No, I was single. You were single uh, yeah, I had, okay. No, I say I was single. I had girlfriends mm. on and off. but It you wasn't know, something that was basically a, an anchor that could drag you back or make no, you a difference. I, I think okay. that for me, I think I sacrificed a lot of relationships on this journey. You have to. What I think is a lot of people think you could have it all, but if you want to be successful, you've got to therefore give up on the normal things yeah. that people have that yeah, they like, enjoy. Absolutely. My friends are out playing football at the weekends, didn't yeah. do any of that. Yeah. You know, my friends are going out drinking all the time. Although I did a bit of that, yeah. not enough. Yeah. No, not like they did. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I, I, I did sacrifice a lot of things, and especially when I started my business, mm. it was just like this has to work. Mm. And it was very different because I had nothing around me. I sold my house, so I got fifty thousand equity out of my house. Mm. I used that to start the business, I got the business going, and I spent the first year it's just issue after issue after issue after failure or not failure but setback after setback just feeling like it was never going to work in the first year and i was just it was so hard but i just wouldn't give in mm. <laughs> i wouldn't give in you know it was not I mean, well the banks all pulled out the market so i had no suppliers so it's like i'll change the product um couldn't get any product um because i started doing cars like selling cars yeah, yeah. Couldn't, couldn't get the product because i couldn't afford to buy the product so it was like all right well how do i do this? so this is the problem solving so i can't afford to buy any cars to sell them so that's a problem because that's what i'm going to do now i can't do finance so who's got cars that they want to sell that i don't have to buy <laughs> so i've moved to a, like a broker model i just go to people and say hey look you know you've got your car at the moment um if you part exchange it it's worth ten thousand. um they're going to go and sell it for twelve and a half if you want 11 and a half, I'll sell it for you. So you get more money. People are like, oh, I love that concept. So it's like an estate agency for cars. And that's how I did the first million in revenue, moving to that model. Um, and I did that first million. After I changed that model, after I found that new 
method. I found a new product range, if you like, a new business model. I took that business model and I got going. And I did a million in revenue of a small amount of profit working stupid hours. Um, and then I, I got a new obsession. And the new obsession is what took me to the next level. And so that's what's quite interesting. So what you've demonstrated here is never to give up. Uh, and it's always to be good at sort of probably it's not actually seeing that there is no way out of something it's just actually your your mindset is there has to be an another solution and be able to pivot as well which is quite interesting yeah. sometimes people get so trapped in an idea that they don't know when it's essential to pivot and, and you see what's interesting is that it's not possible to pivot pivot and uh, unless you've got that long-term aim, you know? Do you know? That's really interesting that you should mention that. Mm. Because for me, it was long-term. Mm. I was not starting this business to to try. Like This was the next decade of my future, no doubt, or maybe longer. Mm. That, that was my mentality. This is for the long, 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 long term. Mm. I didn't start anything short-term. as I'm going all in, and this is it. Mm. That was my mentality, 100%. No safety net. I'm a great believer that you've got to get rid of the safety net. If you think mm. that you could operate with a, with a safety net, you're really not, you're not all in. Yeah, you know? I was one million percent all in, in my hours, in my mentality, in everything. I was all in. Yeah. Too all in. So you, I was obsessed. So you, you, <laughs> and you, so obsession. So we, you then go on to your second business, uh, because all of this sounds like this is real good training, everything you're talking Do about. Do you know what, honestly, it was, it was, it was what it is. Yeah. And that that training, uh, that training. So what happened was, is I knew that I could sell if I could get the clients. I knew that I could build good relationships. I knew that people would want to buy off me, but I did not understand marketing. Mm. So I just got, I just thought, okay, what happened when I didn't know sales? I got obsessed with that and I learned the skill. So now I'm going to learn this skill marketing. Can't be that hard. So I just got absolutely 1 million percent obsessed and I did the same thing and I, I, I dedicated a year of, of, of pure obsession on that skill of reading every book, doing every training course, buying every course I could, um, really then zoned in on social media marketing and got really, 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 really zoned in on the social media marketing and got obsessed with marketing and I loved it and I really started to enjoy that part of it and then I knew if I could combine marketing and sales, then I was going to end up with some money, right? So I didn't know all the rest of it then because I didn't know anything about management, organization, structure, building teams. Didn't understand any of that. But I knew if I could get the leads and I could look after the people, then I knew that we were going to grow. So I, I did that and that really accelerated the business that took it from a million to 2.9 million, then to 4.3 million, becoming more profitable. And by the by, the time I was about twenty eight, the business twenty eight twenty nine, the business was doing six point three million a year, and I'd I'd driven it hard. We had the largest following in the world at that point on Facebook for an automotive dealer. Um, just a few years later, and that's when I hit new challenges. Um, around really and, and that business was what that that's that got that was the car business car business yeah, selling yeah. um cars um via social media yeah selling cars via social media yeah. okay yeah so so you did that and then what was the next step then well i spent a decade in that business mm -hmm. growing that business i took it from being in a tiny little shed like office um well originally in my mum's spare bedroom to being a 40 million pound a year company mm -hmm. and that was over a course of a decade with lots of ups and downs and lots of challenges and, you know, just, uh, you know, I tell stories on it all day long. But mm. yeah, it was just ups and downs and, and drive and grit and commitment. Mm. And I did that for, for over a decade mm -hmm. from that point, you know, and it got me, it was the vehicle that got me. I was a millionaire before the age of 30 mm -hmm. because of that business. So it's a bit like, so you, I could remember, for example, as an 11 year old boy, I decided that one day I would like to own my own farm. The day that I bought my farm, I'd completed the circle. So when you became the millionaire, you completed the circle. And then you had this big moment where I remember thinking, well, well, what next? Do you know what I mean? That's a really interesting point, actually, because I've not heard anyone frame it in that way. But when I did achieve that, that's when I, w I wouldn't say I lost interest, but I found it hard to pinpoint another focus. What do I want to? What do I want to do? 
And actually, yeah, I found that difficult. Because it was just like, do more of the same. Make it better. Make it... And look, to be honest, success... The way I see success now is make it better, 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 make it better. There's so many intricacies of a business that we could focus on. We could look at the client service and we could just make that better, 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 better. You know, and you could do that in every portion of a business. But it's quite hard to do that. Mm. You know, especially when you're wide in that way. And actually, I found myself getting distracted. The bigger it got, the more distracted I got. So what then made you go from that to what, what you're doing now? So what happened is around, around when we were around, I was doing about 30, 30 33 million pound a year, making a lot of money. Um, and I had five sites, I had 120 staff. Um, and I, I did meet a girl mm. and we had a little boy mm. at that stage. And that actually changed my life quite a lot. You know, having my little boy changed everything for me, really. And then when my son was about three years old, he was diagnosed with autism. That changed a lot for me as well. That made me realize that I was going to have to be a better dad. And actually, life started changing. And also around that time, I was being asked. So from a PR perspective, they were starting to put me on magazine covers, um, I was getting articles written about me constantly. I was doing things that were quite innovative. So we were using a lot of innovation in the business. We were getting noticed. We were probably the, we were pretty much known as the best marketed business in the entire industry. And I kept getting asked to speak. And people said, Adam, could you come and, could you come and do this talk? So I did a few little talks and then they got bigger and they got really big. And then I met a speaker, a professional speaker I said, hey, do you want to do you want to come and um, I'm doing this event at the Excel. Do you want to come and sh share the stage with me? And do you want to talk for a bit on, on the stage? I was like, yeah, of course. Now, what I didn't realize when he asked me is that there was 2,500 people in this room. So I get up and I start doing these big stage talks and things. And that's when you talk about purpose, things started to change for me. I actually realized then at that stage that I'd learned a lot. You know, because there's a lot of challenges that I haven't spoke to you about during that period of a decade building that business. Challenges with numbers, challenges with finance, you know, challenges, all different challenges. I learned a lot and I'd overcome a lot of things and, and done a lot of different things. And I, I, I then started to realize actually how much I knew. And I, I started to see firsthand the personal development market, but from actually a different position. I'd always been in the audience, been the person taking the lessons. I now realize that actually I knew pretty much more than most of the people on stage and I had more, more experience than the, most of them, right? Most of them had not built businesses from scratch. Most of them hadn't done these things. And I thought, you know what? I really enjoy actually helping people. And then I started helping a few people and they skyrocketed. And I was just like, wow, like, I'm really good at this. And <laughs> it sounds arrogant, but that's what I was, how I saw it. And I just... I got a bit intoxicated by that world because it almost been like that world had given me what I... You joined You you joined the gods, the ones who actually give out the advice. I joined the gods. gods you know. <laughs> well, it is. It's Interesting bit, way of seeing yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, um, I, well, I'm a great believer in that to be successful in life, one of the tricks is to find your guardian angels. Find those yeah. people who are going to go out of their way to give you a break because yeah and you got to put it out there yeah in order for those people to then um come to you so i think it's really really important absolutely and i i just felt like i really enjoyed that world and i got so much more out of being in that world i got so much more from helping people than i did sitting in a management meeting looking at pnls and looking at gearing ratios and things like that i was just i was tapped out to be honest mm. and and i wanted to to be in this in this world and I wanted to be helping people and then I started speaking I started my own coaching business and that started to really take off and I I just thought that hey this is actually what I want to be doing with my life and to be fair for about a year I'd been neglecting the big business that I'd built you know and I'd been off traveling around the world speaking doing other things leaving a management team in charge there was problems and issues and I just thought you know what I think it's time for me to change. I, I made the, the change. And and the change was? Well, I, I, I ended up closing the business that I'd spent a decade building, which was mad, really, because 
had I sold it at the right point, I probably would have had a an eight figure exit on it, right? But I didn't get that. You know, in fact, I had an exit where I'd put my hand in my own pocket, right? Because, and and that was that was hard, but not actually as hard as I I felt. It was hard on it's harder on other people around me more than it was me, and and that's a strange thing. So this goes back to being weird, you know, because at the time my mother half that I had the baby with was mortified at the thought of me being a speaker, being a coach, training business owners. She just couldn't think of anything worse. She was mortified. You know, everybody else thought I was a bit mad as well, but I was just like, I, I knew. But why do you think those people were mortified at the idea that you're going to be up there speaking? Do they think it's just, you're not good enough or do they think it's something that other people do? I think they didn't understand it. I, d I don't think it was, and I don't think when people try to talk you out of things or when people say these things, often it's just coming from a place of them caring about you. They just don't know how to express it, right? Mm -hmm. Or I think it's all about how... Or fear for fear, them. Fear, Projection, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely... I <laughs> yeah. mean, I think f fear really controls people. Yeah. And f for us to achieve the things that we've done is that you've got to be able to um, handle fear. De definitely, yeah. yeah. I think projection and fear is, is also a part of it. You've got some people that, you know, will try and talk you out of things because, and they've got your best interests at heart because they think you're making a mistake. You've got other people that talk you out of things because they don't want you to change mm. or they don't want a mirror held up to them and showing them what is possible. Mm. You know, you've got all these different sort of um, parts of it. So what's, you know, another one of my saying, sayings is this, is that, you and I have had to make a friend of uncertainty. And most people uh, think that there is such a thing as a certainty. We know there isn't, and therefore we're not afraid of that uncertainty. And if you look at your story, all those uncertainties was your training ground never to be frightened of it. Whereas a lot of what I call the normal people are desperately in search of some form of certainty. We're happy, we know that the only thing that's certain in life is that life is uncertain, and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, and then you run with it. Well, you, well, you, well, you're you're at one with it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I th I think um, on uncertainty, I think like you you can only stack the odds in your favour. You can't you can't control everything, but you can stack your the odds in your favour as much as possible. Mm. And I think that's what I've always tried to do. Um, rather than worry about what could be, if there is a worry, I'll say, okay, how can I make sure that I stack the odds in my favour to avoid that issue? Mm. So, And that you'll always be all right, really. I think there must be something deep in within that makes you think, whatever happens, well, your story says that you'll always be all right, you know? Leave and I do it. feel like that. I don't know whether that is... I, d I do feel like that, you know? I feel you only live once, you've only got one shot, you might, well, as far as we know. So you got to take it, right? You've got to do everything that you want to do. Um, I'm generally a happy person. You know, I'm, I'm happy with my life. I'm happy with the things that I've done. And, and I just think you've got you to live your life. So you're, you decide to close down that business. Um, you, you, you split up from your... Was, were you married or was that your partner? Uh, no, so we were engaged you at that point. But we weren't married, up. yeah. So that's one of the... You know, that, again, that's a classic situation where something's <laughs> got to give up. And then what happens? You then start to get into this sort of um, um, personal training. And so where would you say you're at now then? Oh, so that was, um, you know, I've been now in the, in, in the coaching and training business that I've got, and I've got other businesses now as well, um, for about six years now, six, seven years. And we built that into, you know, a, a multi, multi-million pound company, very successful, very profitable. But more importantly than the money, we've got thousands of clients. We do an amazing job with them, mm. all right? And we do an amazing job. We train them on marketing, sales, branding, numbers, um, their mindset as well, looking at the aspects of su success and really helping people every step of the way. Um, I've done it worldwide now, spoken all, all over the world. Uh, we do primarily look after people in in the United Kingdom. We look after businesses that want to grow and we help them through those growth stages. And I love it. Okay. Um, so what is your personal purpose now? So you, are you, you were very clear in your purpose, wanting to be a millionaire, achieve that. What is now your personal purpose? So now my purpose is really to help as many people 
to be able to build businesses as possible. You know, we, we've we've already created thousands of million pound. Well, say thousands. We've created hundreds and hundreds of million pound companies, and I want to create at least a thousand million pound companies. Right? We want to build those companies up and and help businesses. And I just love what I do now. Mm. So I've, I I don't put myself under a, a cra- crazy pressure now because along that journey, I was able to buy the house I wanted, you know, I've been able to have the cars I want to, you know, make the money I wanted to make. I've, I've kind of achieved a lot of the personal goals. So only, what about, are you married in a relationship? Oh, so well, in a relationship now, I have a really lovely girl. She's lovely. She's wonderful. Um, I, I do really focus a lot of time. My focus now, so as well as the business is on being a good dad. I think that's really, that's quite important to me. Um, I say quite important. It's really important to me to be a good dad. You know, and Sammy, my little boy, he's lovely. He's got autism, and uh, that is that was something that I took hard at the time of hearing it. But now, I couldn't care less about it. I've, it just he's an amazing little boy, and yeah, I've, I'm, I'm there for him. I do the school run on a Tuesday, on a Monday, I pick him up, and you know, I spend a lot of time with him. So being a really good dad's really important to me. And actually really helping businesses and helping businesses grow is mm. what I love doing. I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's a really good um, theme to end on, really. So success is not normal. So part of your job in helping to train these people <laughs> is how do they identify with their own uh, um, abnormality that they have? Because if they don't have that, they'll never make it. Would you agree with that? I think it's something that I could certainly bring into the conversation. Yeah, <laughs> because no, I think it's, it's absolutely is is the, that is that purpose and actually tapping into the purpose or the things that they can use to motivate every themselves. Single, yeah, every decision, just listen to this, you've made, any rational, sensible person wouldn't have made it. Do you think? Yeah, they would they, because if you think about it, there's only five percent of the population that are entrepreneurial. Yeah, the rest um, basically. Um, will not I, I think everybody does have the ability to be entrepreneurial but they're actually being conditioned by the society that we live in i mean if you take the likes of india or any of these developing countries there is an entrepreneurial buzz about yeah. it because there's nothing else but, yeah. the, the, but the more we become sophisticated the more it actually brings about a culture of dependency and so the likes of you and I know it's down to us that there is... Th- th- Absolutely. Do you know what I'll say to add to, add to that? Because I think it's really important. Is a lot of the people that I train don't actually want to be at the level that we might perceive to be successful. Not all of them coming through are, like you said, as as mad as me. <laughs> <laughs> or or they, they don't actually say, I want to be like Adam, or I don't want... That's not actually what they want. You know what a lot of them want is they want... They've, they've took the leap, most of the people I train with now have took the leap to be business owners and they might feel a bit out of their depth and they want structure, stability, they want to actually break the chains of addiction to business to be able to spend more time with their families, they want more balance. Um, but there are a few and I, as you say it, then I can see, I can vision those, those people, I say a few, there's quite a few that have got the ability to go all the way to the top. And I think for those people that want to go all the way to the top, then I think that you're absolutely right. And so if you want to go all the way to the top, get in touch with that abnormality. Exactly. <laughs> so part of what you have to identify, I suppose, is where do you want to get to in terms of, it's a bit like, do you want to have a lifestyle business? Yeah, absolutely. Or do you want to, or do you want to make Which a- Which was odd a, for me, what? just so you know, it was odd for me. What? That was, that was odd for me that when I started training people, I actually had to learn that. That was part of my learning curve. In the first year of, of running a training business in a coaching company, I just presumed that, oh, well, they'll all want to be millionaires. They'll all want to make loads of money. Oh, they'll all want to do this. And they didn't. Mm. And I found that strange. Mm. So I, I actually saw like, no, they don't actually want that. They're, they're happy to, they just want, they want to get their weekend back. Mm. And that was their goal. So their goals were very different mm. to mine. Now, some are not. Mm. But many actually are more focused on the balance that they get in their life and and actually creating those balances. They're not of that mentality, of that obsession and that focus. Mm. You know, I did the TV show um, Rich House, Poor House with... I was on that for two episodes where I swapped homes with Kip 2 and and that was something for her 
uh, was the focus. She actually has the focus and the dedication. But you're right, it's definitely an abnormality. Mm. It's really interesting. Listen, it's been absolutely fascinating talking yeah. to you. It's been really, yeah. really enjoyable. And thank you very, very much for agreeing oh, to, to do this with me. It's been, oh, it's so, been great fun. So glad to see you again. to myself, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, or better known as The Black Farmer. This was the Success is Not Normal podcast. Stay tuned for the next week's episode.